Greetings from the East Africa Philanthropy Network. My name is Spiriti Momo and these are the Ubuntu stories of impact. Modern slavery remains a critical global issue affecting millions in hidden yet most devastating ways. The Freedom Fund, a key player in fighting against this couch, is focusing on regions and sectors where this issue is most prevalent. Their work in Ethiopia is particularly vital in addressing the complexities of modern slavery using a multifaceted approach. Through strategic partnerships, advocacy, and direct interventions, uh, the Freedom Fund, through the guidance of the country representative, Mr. Daniel Malese, is making incredible strides towards a world free of slavery. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Daniel to this platform to talk to us about the impactful work uh, they are doing in Ethiopia. Thank you very much, Mr. Daniel, for choosing to talk to us today and telling us about the impactful work the Freedom Fund is carrying out in Ethiopia. Do you want to take a few minutes to introduce yourself and that work we are talking about? Thank you very much for having me here uh, today. My name is Daniel Melissa. I am the country representative for the Freedom Fund in Ethiopia. Okay. The work of the Freedom Fund in Ethiopia? Yeah. The Freedom Fund uh, is envisioned to um, uh, eradicate slavery across the globe. So slavery has different forms in different countries Okay. as per the context. So in Ethiopia, we are uh, focusing on women migrating to the Middle East for okay. domestic work and also helping children who are in domestic servitude. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been on the ground for the last uh, 10 years, okay. starting from 2015, mm -hmm. uh, and we have seen a lot of change uh, through our uh, intervention in the country. Okay. Let's begin with the broader picture of the Freedom Fund. Your organization plays a very vital role in addressing some critical global issues. So I'm curious about what inspired the birth of the Freedom Fund and what drives its mission in Ethiopia. Yeah, the, the f there are individuals who are living in the situation of slavery. Um, slavery has been abol abolished uh, 200 years ago, but still there are individuals and the number of individuals within slavery is increasing. Okay. So the Freedom Fund is envisioned to uh, mobilize uh, knowledge, local knowledge, okay. um, will, and also capital to respond to this grave um, inhuman act across the globe. Uh, so three foundations came together uh, to create the Freedom Fund. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the Work Free, Humanity United, and Legatum Foundation. These are the three um, mother organizations to uh, establish the Freedom Fund. And it was started in 2014. Uh, so it's young, uh, it's a learning organization, but its impact is so significant in a way. We are currently working with over 140 grassroots organizations across uh, 12 countries. Okay, that's amazing to know. And Ethiopia is a focal point of your efforts. What were the key factors that drew your attention to Ethiopia? There are different milestones for us to start intervention in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, women are migrating to, to the Middle East in search for better livelihood. Uh, this is not only the issue in Ethiopia, but um, in East Africa, uh, and also almost the, the whole of the, the continent. Mm. But these women are not getting proper protection. Uh, they are not making an informed decision when they uh, try to migrate to uh, the Middle East. Mm. Besides, there is there are the s systems which are um, contributing to uh, human trafficking. Okay. Uh, and there are also uh, traffickers, criminals who are... Uh, getting money and also uh, uh, building themselves uh, as the expense of our you know citizens mm. so in, in 2013 the first milestone with the freedom fund was uh, the mass deportation from the kingdom of saudi arabia yeah so uh, a very huge number of ethiopians were deported from the kingdom of saudi arabia to to ethiopia the number is so staggering okay. it's over 160,000. Uh, 
and it was completely uh, a flood in the country. Uh, and this, our system in Ethiopia was not also developed to rehabilitate them, to give them uh, hope, uh, to regain hope and dignity to these individuals. Uh, so the Freedom Fund started thinking of intervening in Ethiopia. So we have done the first scoping in 2014 and officially started the first hot spot in 2015 uh, in Ethiopia. Okay. So primarily the outflux of individuals who are going to the Middle East and trapped for different forms of abuse and exploitation and also trafficking that initiated Freedom Fund to start the work in Ethiopia. Okay. Great to know. And in tackling such complex issues, collaboration is very key. How does your approach in Ethiopia align or differ from other initiatives in the field? That's a very important uh, question for us, mm. for the Freedom Fund, because mm. uh, there are so many things that defines us uniquely. Uh, uh, for instance, we base our intervention on uh, local knowledge. That's why even mobilizing lo knowledge is indicated in our mission. Yeah. So we believe that um, the knowledge that maybe created the problem has also the solution. So with the right um, support, mm. with proper um, collaboration, we can make a lasting impact. So we base on the local knowledge. If you look at my staff in country, all of them are experts who are from the community. So we work on building up of the local context, the local knowledge to respond to uh, the issue. Besides that, we strive for meaningful collaboration, collaboration sure. among our partners. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, we have 25 partners working mm -hmm. together. So we deliberately and intentionally uh, work to help them collaborate than compete. You know, competition among civil societies is obvious. Yeah. So we want to reverse that thinking and the way partners uh, compete for resourcing, compete for data, uh, so many things. So even though they have their own responsibilities to deliver, we make sure that they are collaborating, they are sharing resources, they are sharing knowledge among themselves so that we maximize, maximize the impact. Yeah. The other area where we are unique is, I think, <laughs> blaming and shaming with the system is an outdated approach for us. Mm -hmm. So we closely work with government. Okay. You know, we all know um, uh, the system within the government is sometimes broken and sometimes bureaucratic. Uh, but we found that it's also uh, a vehicle for uh, sustainable change. Mm. So, we have uh, continuous consultation with existing government. Mm. Uh, we try to explain to them the problem and we try to find the solution together. So that really created a lot of change within the Ethiopia system where our partners mm. and the Freedom Fund also contributed to the ratification of new laws, mm. policies and the procedures. So these are, I think, the unique approaches that we follow. Okay. Amazing. And through the journey, Mr. Daniel, there must have been moments that stood out since inception in 2014. Could you share some two very significant milestones? Yeah. Uh, when we start intervention in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, there was a ban in the country, a mm -hmm. ban to migrate to the Middle East. Okay. And as we all know, Ethiopia is poor economically mm -hmm. and the population is so large. And there are youths who want to change their life. And, uh, uh, and we cannot create jobs for all of them. So desperate youths try to migrate irregularly. So our first challenge was how can we convince the government to work on a system that supports uh, regular migration? a system that facilitates safer migration so that at least for the time being these youths have uh, an outlet for them to go out to work come back with knowledge experience and expertise but it was so challenging for us at the moment so we have to change our program title three times the first the first 
program title was uh, promotion of safer migration. Okay. So it was perceived as if we are promoting people to migrate, but it was not. We were promoting the safer part, you know, mm -hmm. the managed one. Uh, that means when our migrant workers require some support from the Middle East, there should be someone to support them. There should be someone for a proper money channeling in can to country, their remittances. There sh should be some way of um, helping them to make an informed decision. There should be some form of bilateral agreement between the two, the two countries. So the initial challenge was reaching to the level where we are now as Freedom Fund, as the Ethiopian government and uh, as our partners mm. was really, really the, the biggest challenge. The, the other challenge is, you know, dependency is always there. Mm. We as Freedom Fund believe that uh, there are local resources. We have to mobilize them properly. Locally. Yes, locally. Mm. And um, there, there, is an, there are experts as well to address to the issue and bring a lasting solution. But it's highly fragmented. So convincing our partners to the level of sharing resources, to the level of sharing expertise, to the level of jointly applying for funding was really, really a challenge. Okay. But now among 25 partners, they, they work as one, mm -hmm. at the same time accountable for own for their own uh, responsibility. So these are, I think, the two okay. big challenges. Speaking about your partners, in no particular order and without playing favorites, do you want to give us a shout out to three key partners? That would be a very difficult question. Okay. Because as you know, uh, most of our civil society organizations are donor driven. Okay. That's, what if, that's why even we are sometimes challenging for our partners to focus on certain thematic areas and okay. capitalize on that. Okay. So if you look at some of them, they work on agriculture, they work on wash, they okay. work on health, they work, work on migration, they work, it's, it, it's everywhere. Okay. So if you are doing everything, then you are not specializing on something. Okay. That's why Freedom Fund only specializes on mm anti-slavery programs mm. and we want our partners also to strategize and focus on few things mm. regardless of the funding okay so what would be the vision the mission of the founder and what are the things that they need to do to make sure that they are building up on the work that they they have been doing yeah so when we start some of them have like 10 thematic areas nine eight thematic areas uh, but slowly uh, I would, I can say, I think from 2015 through 2020, we had 14 partners by then, and only two of them were working on slavery and slavery-like practices. Uh, but at the end of 2020, we were able to ensure 75% um, of them have anti-slavery programs within their thematic thematic okay. area. So, I. I really appreciate all of them, given mm. that, that they are considering it as, as okay. part of their, their thematic area. Okay. And I don't want to really give names because I, I love them all. All right. It's, it's okay. That's understandable. And uh, measuring impact in such challenging environments is very crucial. And how do you approach this aspect of your work? How do you assess and measure the impact of your efforts? Yeah, it's it's very critical thing for the Freedom Fund to measure uh, the impact. If you look at our different programs, we see uh, noticeable reduction of anti-slavery. Noticeable. In, noticeable reduction. So how do we measure that is like our big question. So every time uh, we start a program, we conduct a baseline study. It's kind of mandatory. We have to do that. And then we measure change through through time, and uh, we conduct midline uh, midterm uh, evaluation, and then also when we finish a program, in term evaluation. So we evaluate our, our program, we monitor, evaluate, and also uh, get learning learning from that. So our uh, monitoring, evaluation, and learning department is very strong. So 
before we start any program in any country we do a prevalence study for instance we are currently working on um, reducing domestic servitude among children within domestic work that's huge right it's not supported by the policy it's but we know that children are working as a domestic worker they are supposed to go to school they're supposed to play with other children they're supposed to build their future but they are really working for over eight nine hours per day in the household so we have um, uh, conducted a prevalence study at the end of 2020 uh, and that gave us huge number children are working eight 8.8 hours per day. Mm -hmm. They are not going to school. They are not taking rest. And then we um, uh, implemented that project for two years. And this year, we have conducted a mid-line review. review. Mm -hmm. And then we have found that at least the number of hours that the children are working is reduced by one hour per day. That's huge within two years. And we are going to do uh, in the uh, evaluation when the project ends, which is in 2025. So this is at the heart of our our program, doing that mm. uh, that way. The other change is change within government because we closely work with government. So we count what are the policies, uh, the policy revisions recommended by us, by our partners. Okay. How many of them are ratified? Mm -hmm. What are the issues that we are really advocating with government? And then we count that as they progress, as they also ratified, then we say that this is a change that we were able to contribute to. Mm -hmm. There are recommendations that we made on structural things also. Mm -hmm. Who is managing overall migration in the country? Who is re responsible for identification of trafficking survivors in the country? So those are accepted and the government is working on that. So we measure that way. Most importantly, we measure changes with individual lives. We, we meet individuals who are trafficked, severely affected by their migration. And then we provide them support and we see them becoming, uh, le leading their own life, sustaining their economy, and also uh, even creating some jobs for other women. So there are also individuals that we, we, we count as we uh, continue. In terms of organizations, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in Ethiopia, in 2020, there was no survivor-led organization. No, even a single one. While we have over 100,000 survivors coming in. So we deliberately worked. And now, as we speak, we have five survivor-led organizations in Ethiopia. Right. So we deliberately support them to become organizations mm -hmm. and to speak about themselves mm -hmm. so that we leave the space for them. The space will be occupied by all of them. So there are so many changes. So we measure this way, the change. Bravo for the deliberate work you're doing. Thank you very much. And so diving deeper into your programs, it's very evident that your strategies are multi-layered, as I mentioned. So can you walk us through the core programs of the Freedom Fund in Ethiopia that you're currently spearheading? There are three key programs, okay. and then there are different projects. Mm. The first one is promotion of safer migration. Okay. So we still believe that uh, uh, migration needs to be managed well in Ethiopia. Uh, under that program, we have um, 18 partners uh, working in the community, working with government to improve the system, working with law enforcement units so that they build the capacity of law enforcement units and held traffickers accountable. The second program is um, uh, reducing domestic servitude within children in domestic work. Okay. So there are shelters we run in that program. Uh, there are partners who are working in the community with the employers of children so that the employers will let children go to school. The employers let children play with other children, you know, like a, any other, any, any child. And we have uh, six partners working on child domestic work. Uh, the third program is movement building. Mm -hmm. 
we say movement building especially in all of our programs we want to include those who were previously affected by the same issue for instance if we are working on anti-trafficking program we deliberately bring in previously trafficked individuals we capacitate them and want them to be part of the program okay when we are working on child domestic workers we look for ex-child domestic workers and we bring them into the program so so with this third program we build the movement of those who are affected mm -hmm. to respond to the issue so survivor-led organizations um, funding for uh, opportunities for them to come together and have different convenings and also advocating for uh, the system so these are the three key programs that we are uh, working on in Ethiopia currently wonderful and so partnerships at the, at the grassroots level are very very vital how do you choose choose and work alongside local communities and organizations in Ethiopia that's a, a good question. We sometimes say mm -hmm. funding is available for those who are rich or like big organizations. Yeah, well established. Well established. Mm -hmm. The Freedom Fund has a due diligence process okay. re requirement to look into, mm -hmm. but we don't always depend on that. Okay. We sometimes look into the potential of that organization to make a change, mm -hmm. regardless of us ticking the box, right? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how do you make a, a conclusion that a particular organization is potential? We, we look at um, their presence, where are they located, Yes. what are the past experiences, mm -hmm. even though it's like six months, three months, Okay. what are they have been like struggling to. Uh, for instance, I, can, I think I can give one example. Mm. Back in 2016, mm -hmm. there was a very, very small organization who was working with um, our community-based structure. There is a community-based structure called EDIR in Ethiopia. So everyone is a member of EDIR. It was organized for uh, funeral purpose, you know, to support each other when someone is lost in your family. Uh, but that structure was used during the era of HIV AIDS where, you know, everyone was affected by HIV AIDS. So, that small organization was working with those local structures. And when we start our program in 2015, that organization was not able to satisfy us to, see, to tick our, our boxes. Okay. So the funding was not as we wanted. So the, manage, the financial management was like a big question for us by then. Uh, they have only two, three staff, but they tried a very good pass and they were able to work with, with them. And then we took a bold measure to fund them. We gave them, I think, 20,000 by then. Um, and then after working with us for five years, they were able to impact over 7,500 community-based structures. In every community-based structure, which is mm. EDDER, mm. there are at, on average 200 households. Then we can calculate it, 200 by 7,500. It was so huge. What was the impact? The impact was for that organization to go convince these community-based leaders mm. to include the issue of safer migration into their prog program. Mm -hmm. So 80% of them were able to include safer migration issue into their bylaws. So that means they are there everywhere. It's very strong community-based structure. So they ask about like, where is your daughter? You were saying that she's about to migrate. Did she migrate legally? Are you hearing from her? What are the things that you need to be curious when making the, that decision or helping your daughter to make that decision? So, so that was a huge impact for us. Very huge. So, so that it's not always that we, we look into organization who can satisfy our requirement. Sure. So we... We look at them, of course, it's very important to look into their system mm. and also uh, the way they are managing their grants, the way their, uh, their presence, their experiences, but it's not always working for us. We also look into the potential, which is, it depends on the local expertise. So my staff mm. used to say like, yes, 
they are not able to satisfy this all requirement, but their work in this area is so satisfactory, can we consider them? And then we take a bold um, uh, decision on that. Great. So it's, it's very inspiring to listen to your story. And so sustainability is a very critical aspect. And I want to know how the Freedom Fund plan for the long-term impact of its initiatives. How is the plan looking like? Yeah. Um, sustainability is very critical. Mm. So we look into sustainability, I think, in three layers. Okay. The first one is sustaining individuals who are affected by anti-slavery. Uh, we have a project, project called Thrive in Ethiopia. Uh, that project is helping women who returned from the Middle East but stayed in Ethiopia for two, two, from two to three years without doing anything. Okay. So we go in the community, we identify them, and we found them in a very desperate situation. And then we support them, we help them to uh, secure jobs, and then we follow them for six, six months after they secure job. So sustainability within a formal economy is one big, big area. If yeah. it's children, mm. making sure that they are going to school, mm. they are reunited with their family, so on and so forth. So individually, we look at that as a sustainability. So a st sustainability beyond ordinary project implementation. Mm. The second area is helping grassroots organizations in institutional sustainability. So we fund institutions beyond programs. Okay. That means every organization working with the Freedom Fund will go through organizational capacity assessment. Mm -hmm. It's a joint review process with them. And then they identify the areas that they want to change within their organization. Once they agree, they prioritize, and then we fund them. It has nothing to do with the project that we are funding. So we, we help organizations to become uh, sustainable. The third is working with government, mm -hmm. so that policies, uh, structures, systems, mm -hmm. and procedures are uh, in place. Yeah. So we, we are keen to think that, but it's not an easy thing. Yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> I am aware. So addressing human trafficking and modern sl slavery comes with its own set of challenges. And in your experience working in Ethiopia, what are the most pressing challenges specific to Ethiopia in fight against modern slavery? Yeah, one of the, the biggest challenge is, um, it's, the issue is so complex. Very complicated. Uh, we by now slavery should be eradicated from the globe. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the numbers, it's increasing. Mm -hmm. It's increasing. There was a recent uh, report by Walkfree and IOM on on the issue, and um, the figure is so high, uh, even from the the figure that as compared to the last ten years. So it's increasing. That means the traffickers are p playing very vital role in ensuring that it exists and the corruption and the system disruptor system that's um, existing in the in any government is uh, the biggest the biggest challenge so the complexity plus corruption and then also the system that holds tra trafficking to exist are um, a challenge this the other challenge is um for Grassroots organizations, for those who are um, running programs, are understanding the complexity. It's beyond running a program. It's about human beings. It's violation of the rights of individuals to work, to move, you know, to um, to communicate with with, with families. Uh, so you see sometimes they giving up mm. because you don't see change so quickly. So those are the challenges. Okay. The global pandemic COVID-19 reshaped so many landscapes. How did it impact your efforts and the situation in Ethiopia? It has definitely affected us, every one of us. Mm. Uh, uh, economically, it has affected us a lot. Mm. There was programs 
that we were running, helping trafficking survivors to sustain their, their economies. So um, startups were really in a very severe situation at the, at the moment. Um, it also uh, impacted us in delaying our project implementation. Okay. Uh, we, we are really good in terms of delivering on time, uh, but COVID came in and we were able to stack for, for that long. Mm. Um, it has also affected individuals. Uh, as, as we all know, uh, there are uh, our partners who, whose families are affected. There are um, community members who are affected by, by, by the, the pandemic. So it was very much devastating. Um, but um, everyone was really understanding of the situation. Our donors, our funders, we as a freedom fund. Uh, so we, we try to shift uh, even uh, program uh, plans mm. to support the the immediate community needs, providing support to the community by then. Yeah. So yeah, it has really affected us. We are in a very digital era, and technology is playing a very transformative role in various sectors. How does it factor into your strategies? Uh, we, we don't have option, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, even if. Uh, we are change resistant. Um, we, we have reached to the point where we have to unlearn some of, you know, things and also learn the new tech uh, initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian government is uh, working on um, overseas employment to digitalize the whole process of overseas employment. And I had uh, an oppor the opportunity to uh, visit uh, and you would be fascinated how that really could change everything that we have been working okay so paperless communication between a potential migrant paperless communication between um, recruitment agency and then the job order for at the middle east paperwork uh, paperless communication between the vocational skill training and also the police for, you know, uh, uh, crime clearance and so. Uh, so it's, 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 it contributes a lot to the um, supporting, facilitating uh, those issues. And the Freedom Fund also believes that uh, it's a digital world. So we have to um, um, make sure that we are including our including it into our, our yeah it has become very evident that tackling the root causes is more effective than handling the symptoms and i want to know how your how does your approach address these underlying issues of human trafficking and, and slavery yeah we use uh, grassroots organizations as a vehicle to change okay so we identify mm -hmm. uh, partners, organizations who are working in the uh, most affected localities. Okay. And then we capacitate them. And then we <clears throat> make sure that they are getting the support they require to respond to the issue as it requires. Okay. So for us, addressing the root cause is identifying those who are closer to the issue mm -hmm. and then supporting them to respond. Then we, we do... Uh, that uh, so because of that we have seen a lot of changes mm -hmm. even if our policies are not supporting us for instance domestic work in ethiopia is not ratified mm -hmm. I, I law convention um, convention 189 which gives um, uh, recognition to domestic work is not recognized in ethiopia but we are working to support children in domestic work to go to school to take rest and to play as a child. Mm. How, how do we do that? Because we identify community workers, we give them training, and then we they go door to door to talk to the employers. So for us, addressing the root cause is making sure that we are supporting the system, whatever there in the grassroots and the capacity mm. properly. So we do that way. Amazing. Looking forward. <laughs> 
the path ahead is as important important as the as the journey you've met so far. So what are the key goals and aspirations for the Freedom Fund in the coming years, especially regarding your work in Ethiopia? We have been in Ethiopia for 10 years now. Okay. And uh, we feel like we have, lo we have got a lot of experience. And, and why did you say you're young if you've been in existence for more than a decade? Slavery has been there for 200 years, right? Okay. So... <laughs> We, we are learning our lesson yeah. um, and uh, we are also building in on our shortcomings, uh, frankly speaking. So we are growing mm. uh, and uh, we feel like we have now somehow a concrete uh, foundation. foundation. Mm. So looking forward, we, wanna, we are planning to design at least a blueprint that connects East Africa when it comes to safer migration programs. So Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Eritrea, Somalia, whatever in the, whoever in the region is. Mm. So we wanna design that and try to facilitate governments to share their experiences, to work together. Because if you look at the issue, most of um, individuals in the region are affected in the same way. So it has come a time where collaboration is a mandatory. It's not like a luxury thing that we need to wait. It's kind of a mandatory, especially if you want to make a, a change. So Freedom Fund is looking forward to doing something in East Africa yeah. in, that, in that regard. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to our partners, mm. our, some of our partners has been working with us for 10 years now. So. We want to bring them together and then we want to keep ourselves away from that so that it would be sustainable, it would be run by themselves. So we are designing a program that, that, could, community owned. that could be run by our partners, mm. no freedom funds there, okay. except supporting from, from uh, outside. Yeah. In terms of uh, policy and the government um, things, uh, uh, there are very good initiatives in different countries with different governments. Um, but it's time for Africa to come together. Uh, it's time for the Eastern Africa community to strengthen um, themselves and also learn from the past mistake. So Ethiopia going individually, Kenya going individually, Uganda, Tanzania going individually is not helping us. The investment that was put in African development should be responding to all the needs by now, but it's not working. So we have to step back and see. So we wanna somehow facilitate those discussions as well. Okay, okay, great. And how do you envision the evolution of anti-slavery efforts globally and the role of the Freedom Fund in that landscape? Um, Freedom Fund is the first uh, point fund in the issue and it's exclusively working on that. Mm. Uh, we have office in London, we have office in New York okay. and uh, there are also different um, uh, different areas okay. which we are not working in Ethiopia in that in those areas but uh, okay. for instance strategic uh, litigation mm. you know there are companies you know everything you know, everything the commodities are produced by child labor okay. some of them are really the products of forced labor and so so can we hold big brands companies accountable can we hold big hotels brand owners to be accountable so that workers rights would be ensured sure. are they paying salaries properly mm -hmm. you know so in a global arena there are strategic litigations that we are we are we are working on um, and I'm hoping, because there are also other organizations working on the issue, so I'm hoping um, th if we are uh, strategic enough, mm. then we, we would be able to respond. Great. And now that you're open for more partnership and collaboration, what types uh, of partnerships are you aiming to cultivate moving forward? Partnership needs to be... Um, strategic sure. that means for us it has to be meaningful 
it has to be um, helping us stretch. Uh, so uh, we welcome uh, uh, partnership to share ideas, yes. partnership to share our strengths and uh, weaknesses to learn from. Uh, we also mobilizing capital. Capital is very important. Uh, if you look at the, the funding that's allocated for anti-slavery programs, it's very small. If you look at the funding which is going to the grassroots organizations, is very, very small. Uh, so partnerships that can address those issues are also really important. Uh, we look forward uh, to that. Um, one of, I think the very interesting thing that we are working on now is there are big foundations, there are organizations that want to give, but they don't know how to give. So we have developed a resource toolkit, which they can just log in into our website and see areas that they want to look at if they want to give to grassroots organizations and right. the impact that can potentially create. So I think we are very much open mm. to the wider mm. uh, way of um, partnering with networks, individual organizations, foundations, even a multilateral kind of partnership. Yeah, great. And I hope you attract them. Thank you. Yeah, and for those inspired by the work of the Freedom Fund, how can they get involved or support your course? Apart from the toolkit on your side, what other ways can they leverage to support your work? I think there are different ways that they can uh, support the work. Mm. One big thing uh, we want is they just they, we want them to give attention to the issue if they are uh, curious of the anti-slavery issue then we believe that they can contribute to the issue widely because slavery exists everywhere some of as i mentioned some of the products are products of slavery work products of child labor. Uh, so if the products that they are buying, the product, the, the hotels that they are using, are they like child free? Are they not labor exploitative? Uh, so, it, so if they give an attention to the issue, then that's one way of collaborating because we don't want to uh, be in a circle of the Freedom Fund. We want to eradicate it across the globe. Mm. So that's why. The other area is if they wanted to collaborate with us directly, uh, uh, there is a means in our website, they can contact us mm. and then we can work uh, how we can take it forward. Great. To wrap this conversation up, what is the key message or insight you'd like to share with the global community about the ongoing fight against modern slavery and trafficking. What is that one message that you would like to pass across? I really want to, I want the global community to understand that slavery still exists. It exists in a way that no one even imagined. It's everywhere. So let's come together. Let's fight this um, evil act. Uh, if we coordinate ourselves together, if we are really uh, serious to this issue, we can bring uh, an end to the issue. So my call would be for the global community to come together and fight. Thank you very much, Mr. Daniel. It has been a very inspiring story and we appreciate you for choosing to share it with us today. Thank you very much, it's my pleasure. Welcome to Nairobi and welcome to the European Members Summit. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for watching this episode. My name is Piriti Momo. See you on the next.